Okay, so good morning everyone. And uh, so today's uh, lecture is, I believe, really the true start of our course. So far we were just playing around with things, etc. And so we're going to describe uh, a method which is very, very general and as a surprising large uh, regime of validity. Okay, so these methods actually, the idea was to general... Uh, Newton's equations. That was the idea. Okay. And uh, so, <clears throat> so several players were involved in, several scientists or whatever, several famous guys were involved in this whole setup and some names are, you know, so Lagrange, Euler, Hamiltonian, Hamilton, sorry. The genre. All these mathematicians or mathematical physicists were wanted to generalize Newton's equations. See, first uh, thing about Newton's equations is that uh, is that uh, these were simple differential equations, and if you put your boundary conditions properly, this, there is some uniqueness in solving them and uh, so the idea was to ask how can we have a framework which will you know do this in a much more uh, general thing and so the thing is that uh, and the answer is yes and uh, so for instance i'll just tell you examples where it's valid you know uh, i mean which i uh, see the thing is uh, it's applicable To even non-mechanical systems. By a mechanical system, I mean there is some force and then it acts on something and, you know, that's how we generalize Newton's equation. We had de describe Newton's equations. So places where it works is, you know, electromagnetism. Big surprise, okay, that it works in this. And and nowadays in mathematics, for instance, uh, this uh, there is a it was uh, this method was used in proof of something called the Poincaré conjecture. Okay, and. Uh, uh, an important ingredient in that was uh, a contribution by Perelman where he used uh, Lagrangian or action. He gave an action for, he gave an action which, which he called the entropy functional. And uh, so, so, the, so I'm giving you two wide variety of uh, examples which have, you know, um, Poincare conjecture has nothing to do with it, something about some classification of three manifolds and one wonders and what does that have to do with. But a very, it's a very physics-based uh, uh, intuition that was used, but a, uh, to prove a mathematical problem. Electromagnetism, uh, I mean, uh, you should know that historically people tried to explain electromagnetism using mechanical objects, and that doesn't work. And we will see in more detail in this course why that is, why that is true. Okay. So today is the first uh, lecture where we will see how to use these methods, and I will use two classic examples and we will uh, after that uh, we will gener we will see how to use it in physics in classical mechanics okay so i'll pause here any questions and comments okay so we'll start with truly the first example of uh, of this thing uh, of of this idea of uh, using a functional, it's called the Fermat principle of least time. And this goes back to Pierre de Fermat, the same guy of Fermat's theorem 16, in 1662. He said that given any two points, light takes the path that takes the least time between those two points. Okay, so this was his statement. 
But for me, what is remarkable about this is that at that point in time, nobody even knew if the speed of light was finite. Okay. And it was really estimated by Romer only in 1676. So he made this idea. He got this idea about 14 years before somebody even came up with some number, you know, approximate number. It's a pretty good number, by the way, Romer. And uh, it's a nice uh, history of science thing to figure out how Romer measured the speed of light. Okay, uh, something to do with some satellites of either Jupiter or Saturn, but okay. So the key, uh, and then as an application of Fermat's principle, uh, one can uh, derive the laws of geometric optics. For instance, we will see now that Snell's law of refraction, refraction can be derived using this principle. So let's see how to do that. Okay, so first thing is you should recall that the refractive index of a medium, eta, is C upon V, where C is the speed of light in a vacuum, and V is the speed of light in the medium. Okay, this is something which you may know. Okay, so you consider two media with refractive indices, eta 1 and eta 2, meeting at an interface, which is the XY plane or the Z equal to 0 plane. Okay, so we will consider, we will go to ask, we want to apply this principle, so I have to give you two points. The first point is x1, 0, 1, 0. We will just, we want to just work in the xz plane, so we'll take every, all points to be in the uh, y equal to 0 plane. So x1, z1 in medium 1 to a point x2, z2 in medium 2. This is what we are going to do, and I'll draw a picture now. Okay, so here is this red point, which is x1, z1, which is in medium 1. And uh, the way we are drawing it, this direction is x, and this direction is z. Okay, so this is too thick, let me... Okay, so... Okay, so... Uh, so, so this is x1, z1. Is the starting point and the ending point point here is x2 z2 okay so what i'm going to do here is to say that uh, uh, we are in the same medium first thing and so if uh, so fermat's principle in a medium what does it say uh, it will take uh, so since the velocity is constant of light uh, in that medium is constant if you give me any two points what will be the shortest distance between those two points Straight line. Direct okay. straight line joining them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so the only thing we need to do is now. So, 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 so uh, we will assume that it uh, crosses the z equal to zero line or y z plane at x zero at the point x. Okay. So here we are. Just, okay. So this is the point we are giving. So, what does it mean? So we'll use. So from here, from x one z one to x zero, it will follow this blue path. Starting from here, you just draw the straight line, it comes here. Correct? And from here to here, it has to follow this. So, so the paths are given, but there can be, so what we see here is that the, it is just piecewise linear, two straight lines, they meet at this point. Okay? And what is it we want to do? We want to, uh, so let's say the distance between uh, this, this length is d1 and this length is d2. Okay, so and we want to ask how much time it's going to take along this path. So I'll multiply by C for obvious reasons. So C times T, this is a dimension of length. So time taken for uh, as a function of this choice of X. So if I vary X, the time changes, of course. So CT of X will be C D1 by V1. Because D1 by v, V1 gives the time it takes to go from here to here at speed V1. So the total time is C1 D, C D1 V1 plus C D2 V2. And just using the definition, this is just eta1 D1 plus eta2 D2. Okay, so then we can just do some simple, uh, you know, uh, Pythagoras theorem or whatever trigonometry or whatever I will do Pythagoras. So this length here is x minus x1 and this length is z1. Okay, so D1 will be x minus x1 whole square root of 
x minus x1 whole square plus z1 square. Similarly here, this is x2 minus x. So it will be x minus x2 whole square plus z2 square under square. So we now have the function. So we have t, the time taken as a function of x. So as we change x, uh, this number will, this is a function of x. Okay. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Okay, just for a future, yeah, go ahead. Sir, for using the Fermat principle, we have to know x to z2, right? Like, we can't predict... Uh... No, 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 I'm asking. So, no, that's not, you misunderstood. Fermat theorem says, given any two points, light takes the path that uh, takes the least time to go from this thing, okay? So, I have to give two points, and I'm giving you the two points. Okay, if, I, if you give, if you change this x to z2, then choose something here, you will get a different path. I mean, that's okay. I'm saying that, uh, so I'm asking if, uh, what is the direction in which I have to send, I mean, what you are saying is if I send it in some direction, it will go somewhere. I mean, I'm not asking that question. I'm saying, uh, for my principle, is doing a slightly different thing. It says, you give me an initial position, you give me a final position. And what will be the Okay, so we have to okay. So this angle theta 1, this angle theta 1 is, uh, I mean, uh, not given to you. So usually when we do refraction experiments, we fix theta 1 and then we measure, uh, we ask what is theta 2. That's not what we are doing here. Okay, sir. Okay, it's a different question. Okay, but it will come to that, don't worry, in a moment. Okay, so let's, uh, so theta 1 is this angle, right, if there is with respect to the normal. So sine theta 1 is x minus x1 upon d1, just trigonometry. Similarly, sine theta 2 is x2. So I've been careful about sines, which is x2. Uh, okay, it's x2 minus x, not x minus x2. It's x2 minus x upon d2. So this is sine theta 1 and this is sine theta 2. Just trigonometry standard. Okay, this is 90 degrees. Okay. So, so now we'll, we can restate uh, what does Fermat principle tell you. It says you have to uh, minimize this time. So the x is our free variable here, okay, and you minimize it, okay. So what is it we do? You have, you have to first do the extremum condition. Take the first derivative with respect to x and set it to zero, right? That's what we will do. So you just go ahead and do that, and lo and behold, you get this, okay. Uh, remember, this is just d1. This is d1, okay. But since I wanted to, uh, I wrote it in this form because I want to want it as a function of x. So you get eta 1 x minus x1 upon d1 plus eta 2 x minus x2 upon d1 equal to 0. Okay, this is what you get. And now you go back one slide and you look at the definition of uh, sine theta 1 and sine theta 2 with the correct, uh, you know, I took care of some signs. And then lo and behold, you get Eta 1, this should not be n1, it should be eta 1. Okay, which is Snell's law of reflection. So, so do you understand? Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. It should be x minus x2 by d2. No, when you go, when you take this to the other side, no, please, you do your uh, things correctly. So, uh, see, it's increasing in this direction, right? So, this direction will be this minus this. So this is all, depends on which way my axis go, but I think I have done, I have chosen something in a particular way. So, okay, I was looking at it this way. So, you, I think I'm consistent. Let's put it that way. Okay. So if x is increasing in another direction, this length x, this x, so if you look here, you will see that x is greater than x1 and x2 is greater than x, right, with this axis. So we want a length, we, we want a positive number, so x2 minus x will be positive, x minus x1 will be positive. 
You agree? So I am saying about uh, the equation where. No, 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 no. Minimize. Fine. Hey, please do the derivative in your paper. I'll, I'll wait for one minute. Sir, sine theta two must be x minus x two upon d two, right? I I disagree. I mean, at least all my trigonometry tells me it has to be x two minus x upon d two. D two, right? You wrote d one. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. D two. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I'm saying. Oh, okay. I was looking at the numerator and not the denominator. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. Anything else? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So this is it. So we see that we have obtained uh, this thing. Okay. You can do another problem, which is again simpler. So you pay now here. I choose x2, z2 here on uh, in medium two. But suppose we wanted to do it in medium uh, one itself. So we want to get the deflection law. Again, you can check for yourself that uh, you know what will happen is that the shortest distance ha is when uh, theta one equal to theta two, angle of incidence equal to angle of deflection. You can prove that also. It's the same thing, but it's theta one, theta one, so that cancels away. It becomes sine theta one equal. To. Okay, but a much more interesting one. Suppose we have an inhomogeneous medium. That means eta varies as we go along the z direction. So, so there is some slab, okay, and eta is not constant. So this is z direction as before. It varies. Okay. So exercises apply Fermat's principle and determine the trajectory of light in this medium. Okay. So the way to solve this is to take this and break it up into tiny slabs. And do an exercise similar to what we just did. So, okay, and lo, and lo and behold, you will get your trajectory. Hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead. So, Fermat's principle states that uh, the light should take the path of minimum time, right? Yes. Then why are we assuming on first hand that it should also take a path of minimum distance? I mean. No, it's just because I multiplied. No, 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 no. I just multiplied by c to get something which has dimension of distance. But the function I have derived is nothing to do with that. It's uh, the time taken only I have to take. I mean, why are we taking that uh, straight line? It could be a curved line, right? No, I think that's the first question we asked, right? Within a medium. You are saying curved line is shorter distance between two points in a single medium than straight line. No, sir. That's what I am saying. That why do we need to take a shortest distance? Because we are applying Fermat's principle. You have to believe. I mean, if if you, you don't believe in if you don't believe in Fermat's principle, there is nothing to discuss. Okay. So, so, uh, so for is, applying Fermat's principle, we took the uh, first derivative and uh, made it to be zero, right? Yes. You have to take second derivative and check that it's a minimum. You need to do that also. But that I'll just exercise uh, for you. The derivative thing we did for Fermat's principle, but then why are we taking the shortest path thing for at first? We Did didn't take short. Any? We didn't take shortest path. I'm sorry. This function here has nothing to do. It's not the shortest path. Shortest path between these two points is this line, straight line. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So he is talking about x1, z1, two point x0. Yeah, but that is. The, yeah, I mean, then uh, within a medium, velocity is uh, speed of light is a constant. So whether we talk of time or distance, they are the same thing, no? Within a single medium. So it will be a straight line. Yeah. Sir, uh, I have a uh, question. So, uh, can we say that uh, uh, this Fermat's uh, theorem is a model that, uh, in the end, describes the experimental results correctly? Yes. Absolutely. But it doesn't really explain why it happens. Am I right in saying that? We are. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. Yes, it doesn't. Most of the I mean, but I mean, I want to ask you, what is it tell, which tells you Newton's laws is anything special? Does it explain why those equations are there? 
No, sir. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that is, uh, the, yeah, I mean, for, to me, it remains a mystery as to why even this method works. Not just in this, it works in such a wide variety of. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a, that's absolutely that question. It doesn't say why. Okay. So this exercise, I leave it, uh, maybe it is there in the next assignment. I don't know. I'll, when I do the assignment, I'll come to this. So this is something which you can do. So you'll get, now you, it's like, uh, so each time you'll draw something and you'll get some rule and it will give you some path. Okay. So, is what is that like you know. but the birth of the idea of uh, variational method uh, goes back to a problem posed by Johann Bernoulli in 1696 okay so this is many many years after so much principles okay and uh, see in those days people used to Scientists have some competition kind of thing. They will challenge each other with problems and ask for solutions. Okay, so this is what Johann Bernoulli did. He comes from a famous family of Bernoullis. Everybody was is quite famous. So the whole bunch of brothers. So it says that given two points A and B in a vertical plane, what is the curve traced? Okay, what is the curve traced out by a point acted on only by gravity? which starts at A and reaches B in the shortest time. Okay, so, so the picture is like this. Gravity is pulling something downwards. You are given uh, two points A and B. And you are allowed to construct some kind of support like this. Okay, and question is, what is this? Uh, how much is Then once you do this standard stuff, we can work out how much time it's going to take to go from A to B along this curve. Okay, so think of some support. So does it mean like a wire is being hung between A and B? And that Not a wire. Be. You can even think of it as, you know, you, you're dropping a ball and there is a slope you create. So the question is that uh, path along which it will take a minimum time. Time, along time. Yeah, so he has to, yeah, so you, are allowed, so you are allowed to choose any shape. You can choose any shape you wish. Okay. So, so this is the thing. So this was the problem he posed. Okay. And, uh, and the answer, is, of course, he got the answer. And the story is that, uh, um, and Newton also solved it and uh, he gave it to some journal and he wrote it, uh, he gave it, uh, it was done anonymously, but it was something in England. And uh, so Bernoulli immediately realized that uh, it was uh, Newton and he said that a, li a lion or a tiger can be recognized by its, uh, you know, footmarks, right? So that's what he said. So <laughs> anyway, so coming back to this, so let's, uh, let's call this curve. Z of X, so this direction is, vertical is Z, this is X, okay, and uh, so that Z of X, okay, denote a curve which starts at Z equal to ZA and ends at Z. Okay, and the X values are XA and ZA. Okay, so <clears throat> So, so now we can just do some standard things. We can use conservation of, uh, you know, energy if you wish or whatever. You can easily do that. And uh, you can, you will see that the velocity at any instant is the amount. So it's just dropped here at Z8 with zero velocity, uh, zero speed, zero velocity. And so when it comes here, it will be going at a tangential direction to this. But the thing is that the the, uh, the drop here will be the uh, potential energy which will be converted to uh, kinetic energy. Okay, and um, what have I done here? Yeah, and I've assumed that uh, I'm assuming that the mass is point mass. Okay. 
Okay, so there's no mass, otherwise there would have been a mass here. So half mb square would be g into za minus z. So it will be how much it has fallen, right? So v would be square root of this, but velocity is just square root of x dot square plus z dot square. And we can just pull out this x dot outside and it is just 1 plus dz by dx whole square. Okay, I'll pause here and ask you if you understand this computation. Okay, so I guess you all understand this, so I don't need to worry. Okay, so now we want to work out what is the time it takes along the curves z of x. So you're picking a curve z of x and you're doing this. So it's an integral from point A to B dt. But dt we can write as dx by x dot. And now at t uh, at initial time it's at xa and it goes to xb at final time. So dx by x dot. Sir. Yeah. Uh, in the integral, uh, in the red colored integral, you have written uh, dx into, and uh, where did the x dot go, sir? Oh, it got cancelled. No, no, so I have to use this formula, right? I have to use, I will use this formula, right? x dot equal to, uh, uh, you know, square root of 2g z minus z uh, divided by this second square root. So that's what this is. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, I hadn't reached that point. So I just reached only here. So x dot, I use this above formula and substitute for x dot and I get this. So what is nice about this is that this only depends on this. Uh, this is now a fun. Uh, so this uh, takes as input this function z of x. So it appears in two places. One is here in the denominator as z, in the numerator it appears as dz by dx, the derivative. But if you give me the function z of x, I can take derivatives, right? So this is what we get. So this is, uh, now uh, what is this? Uh, t of z is a generalization as a function. What does it do? Uh, what is its input? It takes input, not a number, but a function, z of x. And it gives, and, and it out gives and outputs a real number, which is the time taken. Okay, so uh, this is a function of a function. So people don't say that, you just call it functional. Okay, so do you understand the beast that we have got? So unlike Fermat principle where we had only a function, right? We had only one variable x. Here what we have is a full curve. Okay. So I'll pause here uh, so that you can ask me questions. Sir, hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the point A has coordinates x a comma z a, right? Yes. And point so, B has x b comma z b, correct? So, so the red integrand at the point x a, which is the lower limit, the the, the, the denominator, denominator is zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, yeah, can, yeah. can we say that the integral exists? Yeah, it exists. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, that's because x dot is zero, no? At that point. Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to look at the right hand side. Yeah, yeah. Just because the denominator vanishes doesn't mean the integral is. Uh, Sir, for, uh, we wrote the equation of V as root 2G uh, Z minus Z. So there we assume there is a uh, downward gravitational force. Yeah, we are assuming that. Yeah, yeah, that's what this Sir, is. Sir, but what about the normal force? Uh, we usually take that in problems like this. I have not. Force you can do it through that. that. No, no, I, I leave it as an exercise for you. But I just use conservation of energy. I just said that the fall of uh, so much, this uh, potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. That's all I've used. You can do with forces. I don't need the force. That's all. Okay. 
for this computation. You can do it with forces. I mean, I, I, it is used. I mean, in the sense that what we are saying here is that it is moving. The force is normal, and we are looking at the tangential velocity, right? So, so the tangent part I've used. That's why dz by dz x comes. Okay. So we, I'm not saying that the particle, uh, the mass is going to yeah, is moving. I mean, the curve is does take. We, we do take this constraint into account. It's been accounted for. Hello, sir. The uh... The fact that we are not letting it uh, fall free and we are restricting its path along the path along mm -hmm. which it will take the shortest time is itself a constant and the forces of constant I mean the normal force should be contained in that only right no no I don't need I I don't need it for my computation but you can go ahead and do you can go no, back yes, and do sir, it. Uh, I, 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 I'm not I'm saying, saying I'm not I don't need the, why do I need the normal forces. I'm not interested. That's not something yes, I want that to That is not needed. That's what I'm saying. That mm -hmm. it should be contained in the fact that it is a uh, constraint to move yeah. along that path. Exactly. In our yeah. situation. Exactly. So we have implemented the constraint by saying it's on the curve set of X. And it's one of those examples where the normal force is one of those constraint forces. Okay. And uh, this formulation, the advantage is that you don't need to compute the constraint force. So in high school, what is it we may have done? We may still have used conservation of energy. If you didn't want to use it, you can still work out at any given instant in time what the force is, etc. But it will work out to be the same thing. Okay, absolutely right. Okay. So, so what we get is a functional and we need to, uh, you know, minimize, minimize this. So how do we go about doing this? It looks complicated. Okay. So there are conditions on this curve. Z of xA should be Z A and Z of X B should be Z B. That's the only constraint. It may be anything. There can be other curves. Okay. So I just draw some sample curve. Okay. So question is, so we want to vary this curve. So we could choose a second one. No, it goes. Okay. I don't know. Okay, I drew something flat, but okay. Shouldn't throw a freeze there, but okay, we'll see what I mean. We can choose something like this also. And ask what is the answer, but ask which one has the. So we can now restate the problem of Bernoulli. Find the curve z of x that minimizes the functional t of z, t of z of x that we just defined. Okay, so this functional does not have any explicit dependence on x. So let's go back to this function. Okay, so, it, so you see on this right hand side, x doesn't appear. It only appears through the function z and its derivatives. Okay, this is, this is just an observation. Okay, and what that we will see in later lectures is that that implies a, uh, that there is a conserved quantity. Okay, symmetry implies conserved quantity, something called Noether's theorem. And in this case, what it says is that the square root of z a minus z times 1 plus dz by dz x square equal to some constant. OK, so I'm not uh, I will derive this later. But then if you have this thing, you can just you can see that we can uh, this is like what we had for uh, Newton's equations. We saw that in 1D energy, uh, you know, let you uh, instead of solving second order differential equation. We just straight away went to energy and then did, uh, you know, up to a sign. We took a square root. Same thing happens here. You get dz by x equal to plus or minus square root of c square upon z a minus z minus 1. And the solution that is given is a cycloid. It's given in parametric form below. Okay. So this is what you get. Beautiful. Okay. So a cycloid is, uh, what is a cycloid? If you, uh, if somebody is going on a bicycle with constant uh, speed in a straight line and you, let's say you put a sticker on one of their, uh, on, on, uh, a bright uh, yellow neon sticker on the, you know, on the tube at one point. And you can ask, uh, uh, and you're observing what path it traces. So it will trace something like this, you know. Okay. So, uh, I mean, depends on the speed, etc. So this is an example of this. So, so that's, uh, that's what a cycloid is. Okay. And by the way, that's a beautiful YouTube channel by somebody who calls himself three blue, one brown. And he has this, uh, he has an episode on Brachister Crone with Steven Strogatz. Okay, Steven Strogatz is a famous mathematical physicist. Okay, so.
So what you see here in uh, in uh, in this magenta color is a link. Okay. So if you take this PDF file and click on it, it will take you to this particular episode. Okay. I strongly recommend uh, viewing this. Okay. So in all my things, whenever I give links like this, it will show up in this color, and which means you can it's a clickable link in PDF only. Okay. So now we will just uh, in the next 10 minutes or so we will ask how what is the direct approach to extremizing functional. So it looks a little difficult, at least for me. I mean, how, what does it mean to vary this function? You know, space, there are functions are all over the place. So, so we will do something simple. So we'll, what we will do is, if you need to find the minimum or maximum of a function, or extremum of a function in one variable, what is it we will do? We first determine the solution to df by dx equal to zero, correct? Then we analyze whether it's a maximum or minimum by studying the value of the second derivative at each of the solution. This is what we do, right? And look at its sign. What do we do for n plus 1 variables? Y plus 1, you will understand. We'll just call them x0, x1 up to xn. This is this function. So what is it we do? We study the simultaneous uh, solution to n plus 1 equations, which is just, uh, you know, the derivative with respect to each of these variables should be 0. So this is the condition for extrema. Okay. And uh, we discussed in the earlier lecture that the eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix of second derivatives at every solution determines the nature of the extrema. So you can have now it's in higher dimensions, so you can have, you know, some directions will be stable, some directions will be unstable, so on and so forth. Okay. So this picture is clear, right? So this we know how to do. So what we will do now is uh, instead of uh, trying to solve such a complicated uh, problem where we have to uh, yeah, obtain this whole, uh, I mean, uh, try to write a full function, we will try to convert it first into a problem which which looks like this, the second part. Okay, and then uh, we will try to take the, uh, we will try to understand how, uh, how to go back and f figure out uh, the actual equation. Okay, so let Q of T be a function from the interval 0 to T. So I'm just saying how to extremize a functional from uh, from 0 to, so we are looking at maps which go from the interval to real line such that q of 0 equal to q1 and q of t equal to q, q2. So it's like this function, its initial and final points are given to you. But beyond that, the, you have full freedom, you can vary the function in it. And let f of q of t be a functional, that's a map from the space of all curves of this type. So what does this do? It takes a curve given like this and spits out a number, which is a real number. So what we do is we simplify the problem in the following way. We discretize the interval 0 to t into n segments. So we say let t a be, be a equal to a times epsilon, where epsilon is, uh, you know, just some t by n, which is some time scale. So in the limit n going to infinity, this becomes like almost becomes a continuum limit. Okay, so a equal to 0 to n will give you this time. So what is happening now, what we are doing is instead of considering a smooth uh, curve Q of T, we only look at the values of T corresponding to T A and we'll just call those variables X A. X A, I did not use equal to here because sometimes you may want to put some, there might be some, in some situations there will be some factor, okay, some scale factor, which will be common for everything, so that's not important. So X A is just Q at time T A, which is A times epsilon. Okay, so what we are getting instead of looking at arbitrary functions, I am looking at a function of now this becomes this functional becomes effectively a function of n plus one variables, and we'll call that function f little f of x zero x one up to x n. Is it clear what we have done? So maybe this picture will show you this. So if this is for n equal to four. So these uh, initial points are given. And now what is happening is I've drawn circles. I've drawn these circles to indicate the value of uh, Q at these points. So, I mean, we don't know what path it took. You know, there could be many paths. There could be something which goes like this. Let's, let's try to draw something smooth, maybe something like this. But we have lost that information because we are not sampling in this region. So we just have this data. So the idea here is that we can move these points anywhere. These three guys, we can move anywhere. And we can ask when is when does this function become a minimum? 
little f of x0, x1 up to xn. So extremizing it is now exactly like we discussed, df by dxa equal to 0 for all a equal to 0 to 1. So I converted it to this kind of problem. Okay, so this we know how to, because we know how to solve. And the idea is that we will take a limit when n goes to infinity, we hopefully will recover a functional which is an extreme of the extreme of the function. Okay. But the tricky point here is, uh, you know, the set of points x0, if you take some random set of points, x0, x1, will be a comma, x0, x1 up to xn, need not go to a smooth function, it can be extremely jagged, discontinuous. Okay, so the space of functions that you get that way is much, much larger than the set of smooth functions. Okay, so changing the function corresponding to the change of values of xa in discrete, in the discrete version. It's very, very complicated, but it doesn't matter. So, but we will act as if this function which we get f is smooth. We'll say it's some smooth function. Okay, the Taylor series of a function tells us how the function changes when you change these values. So, f of x plus delta xa is f of xa plus df by dxa delta xa plus order delta x square. Okay, this is just a standard Taylor series. We are keeping the first term. Is this clear? Okay, so, so now the question is, uh, we want to take the continuum limit of this kind of formula. I'll write something now, okay, and then we will look. So, so what uh, well, this delta x is, if you take the continuum limit, they will, that will correspond to changing some curve. Uh, original curve was q of t, and q of t plus delta q of t is some new curve. Okay, is this clear, what I'm saying? q and q plus delta q are two different curves and delta q is how they differ. Okay, so, so what we will get is uh, analog of Taylor series here. Okay, but I will write some things and explain this term. So this is f of q plus delta q, that is this term. This will go to this functional, we know that, f of q of t. This will also go to the functional. But now summation should go be, become an integration. Because here it was discrete, here it's a continuum thing. 0 to t dt, right? And this, uh, uh, and it should be linear in delta x a will go to say delta q of t prime, but whatever remains in red, I, this is just definition of this quantity. It's just delta f of q by delta q of t prime. That's what it means. Okay, so let us see how to do, how to handle this. So the quantity in red is being defined by this kind of Taylor series for the functional. Okay, so let's proceed. So let's uh, see how to take the continuum limit. So we start with this obvious formula. Delta AB is the Kronecker delta. You sum over B. Delta AB, delta XB. What is that equal to? It AB only clicks when B equal to A. So we can carry out the B summation and you get delta X. Trivial statement. Okay. So now we want to write a continuum version of this. So first I will do this. Note that the usual definition of integration, there's a length, uh, you know, summation A does not have any length uh, as some dimensions of time. So we have to multiply it by time, right? So epsilon times sigma A is what goes to integral. Okay, so you put an epsilon here, but there's no epsilon on this side. So you have to actually divide by epsilon. So then the summation becomes integration. Second thing is, this is an important point that Delta AB by epsilon is the one which goes to the Dirac delta function. Okay, where T is A epsilon and T prime is B epsilon. That's what is the continuum limit. Once you do that thing, then, and uh, then you find that this formula becomes this. The summation became integral, this Kronecker delta became this thing, but if you look carefully, this epsilon cancels with this epsilon. So summation B delta AB actually goes nicely to integral dt prime delta of t prime minus t. So this is the continuum version of this formula. Okay. Now this quantity here, look at this. Let's look at this quantity. Delta f by delta q t prime. First thing is f of q is a num. It does not depend on any parameter. So this object has only one. It's a function of t prime. It's not a functional anymore. Okay. 
we'll compute it and you will see in a moment. Okay, so we, uh, the idea here is uh, I won't do it this way. I'll do it as f of q plus delta q minus f of q and keep terms to linear order. That's what we will do. So let's do one computation. So we'll do two examples and I will stop here. So the first functional is integral 0 to 3 dt q of t power p. p is any any power. Okay. So we want to do this computation. So you just go ahead and write the definition. So you get integral f of q plus delta q minus f of q is integral 0 to t. So what this says is wherever you see q, you put q plus delta q power p minus q of t. Now you do the usual binomial theorem expansion and keep only terms to order delta q. And uh, so first thing is you'll see the leading term gets cancelled and we are left with this red piece, which is the coefficient of delta q by this thing, delta q. So this says, so looking at this, we get, let me write it in red again. And it's convention to use square brackets, by the way, for functional. Let's do something more complicated. Now it is uh, f of q is integral 0 to 2 t dt q dot of t. So dq by dt is appearing whole square. But we can still go ahead and do this. So f of q plus delta q minus f of q. The first term here is q dot plus delta q dot. So we just take, uh, I mean, uh, so that's just taking the derivative of the time derivative with respect to q. Again, you expand it and keep only terms up to uh, delta q. So delta q, delta q dot, everything you say is the same. But now we have to, but this does not have delta q. So we have to integrate by parts. Integrate by parts, what does it do? It takes one time derivative and brings it on to this. So we'll delta q dot. I'm using this formula and then integrating by parts. Okay. And you get a quantity in red. But what I want to look at is what I call the surface terms, which you integrate by parts. The boundary terms come. Q, this is the boundary term. Q of t, delta Q, evaluated at the endpoints, which is 0 and t. But we know that uh, we are looking at a set of curves where the value of q, well, these two curves, q plus delta q and q, are such that both of them at 0 and t, they have the same value. So delta q of t is 0 at 0 and t, capital T. Is this clear? So this term drops out, and then we get minus 2. So the integration by parts gives a minus sign. So we get, in this example, Okay, please ask questions now. Okay, so I've shown you how we would go ahead and do. So it's kind of interesting that it's really the Taylor series. What we generalize is the Taylor series uh, version of functionals, which works better then looking at, uh, you know, uh, calculus way of doing things. Okay, this is what happens. And, uh, and if you look carefully, you can see that uh, this has exactly, if you just ignore the this integration parts, you see that it is just taking, you look at this and you tell what is it you have done if you're doing Q derivative of this, you have written PQ, P minus one, that's exactly what happens. Okay, but I wanted to show you something slightly more intricate, but it just comes from this. Okay, so with some practice, you can just do this in your head. Okay. So now comes the, so now, so yeah, so now the point is we, uh, we know at least know how to compute this and we will take our intuition. So what was the extremum condition? It said, set these things to zero. So the analog of that would be to set 
this red quantity in red to be zero. That's the extrema. Okay. So if you do that, okay. So in this, I am not showing you this computation. I'm just giving you the answer. Maybe like next lecture we'll spend some time. And what you get is something very, very nice. You get this quantity in red, and this is you have to set to zero. So this is the analog. It's a differential equation. Okay, and if you if you just blindly for a moment replace x by t, you'll see that this has a term which is d, d by dt here, and there's a dz by dt. So you'll see that it's second derivative. It has terms second and first derivatives in z, and so on. So for this complicated, but nevertheless it is some equation. Okay, which is second order. Okay, so this is uh, what you get. So you get differential equations as opposed to so. Uh, when you're extremizing functionals, you get differential equations. So what we see is if you give me a functional and you want to extremize it, you will get a differential equation. Okay, so this is the key key idea. And these are what we will call uh, this thing. So if you want to solve some problem, if you, you have to come and tell me what is your function. So in this case, it is a Brachistock road functional, which we, we derived. And it gives you some complicated looking thing, but it's not that complicated because one derivative can be done and we will get. So basically what will happen is that is that. Yeah, so what what we will have is that uh, D by D. So what we will get is that the, this D by DT or D by DX of the square root is zero. Okay, this is the kind of equation we will get. And uh, so when you integrate it, you, the C is that integration constant. Okay, so you, 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 it's some work to show that if you take d by dx of this equation, you will actually get not that hard work, but you can show that it will become this red uh, quantity in red equal to zero. Okay, so so I'll stop here. This is so so the yeah so. Uh, so uh, the idea here is that you have to give some functional and you extremize the functional, you get some differential equation. Now the question is, well, how do you come up with this functional? Like I mean, who ordered that Fermat principle should be principle of least time, right? These are the kind of things which uh, are questions to answer. So we'll find that in certain instances, we can use symmetries in the problem, et cetera, et cetera, and figure out what the action should be. So the, the functional should be, okay? And I'm just giving you a reference. It's a beautiful book uh, with title Perfect Form by Don Lemons. Uh, you can, uh, I mean, you can, it's a very, very nice book. Not very essential for our course, but it's a very nice book. Okay. But our goal mechanics in terms of functionals. Okay, so this is what we will do starting next lecture. So floor is open for questions and maybe I'll stop the recording.